Disc three of the Chronicles of Berberine completes our section on berberine in inflammation, toxicity, apoptosis, autoimmunity, and malignancy. We talked about the role of berberine in protecting against cell damage in experimental sepsis and in liver injury in association with toxicity. We showed that in prostate cancer and breast cancer, at least in tissue culture and animal studies, berberine promotes apoptosis, cell suicide of malignant cells without compromising and actually enhancing the tumor killing efficacy of radiation therapy and chemotherapy. Now let's talk about berberine in experimental renal ischemia reoxygenation injury. We're going to take human renal proximal tubular cells, kidney cells, and tissue culture. We're going to incubate them with vehicle or berberine at various doses. Then we're going to create hypoxia reoxygenation injury by exposing them for 24 hours to 1% oxygen, followed by three hours of normal oxygen. And this would sort of mimic acute kidney failure in a sick patient or what they were really looking at. They were looking at what happens to the kidney in a transplant situation during the time period after it's removed from the donor and it's being transported to the recipient. It's not getting enough oxygen and then when it's implanted in the recipient, it's getting reoxygenated. They're going to look at the effect of berberine on loss of cellular function due to this hypoxia reoxygenation uh, situation. Berberine has no toxic effects on normal kidney cells, but the loss of oxygen followed by reoxygenation leads to cell death of 50% of the cells, and this is blunted by co-treatment with berberine. So the ability of the cells to survive hypoxia reoxygenation is, is, is increased with berberine. Malondialdehyde rises, superoxide dismutase falls in response to this hypoxic reoxygenation insult. Basically, whenever our cells are damaged, whenever they're stressed, we get oxidative stress, we see an uptick in markers of oxidative inflammation and a reduction in our antioxidant defenses. And that occurs here, and this is, of course, blunted with berberine. Um, apoptosis of the cells, 23% commit suicide in response to hypoxia reoxygenation. This is blunted with berberine. Um, and again, we have um, oxidative stress in the mitochondria. It causes uh, energy failure in the mitochondria, a rise in Bax to Beckel, cytochrome C, is released from the mitochondria, the cell fluid, and activates the executioner enzymes, the cells commit suicide. The endoplasmic reticulum is a scaffolding region in the cell, and a lot of, of uh, enzymatic activity is occurring there. In response to oxidative stress, we have what's called the unfolded protein response, and certain molecules are activated that also will activate the executioner enzyme systems. And you can see, in response to hypoxia reoxygenation, the Bax to Beckel ratio rises. We release cytochrome C into the cell fluid. This is blended with berberine. The um, endoplasmic reticulum apoptotic pathway is upregulated in response to hypoxia reoxygenation. This is blended with berberine. And the executioner enzymes are activated uh, by this hypoxic reoxygenation stress. This is blended with berberine. Um, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about immune dysregulation. We're going to look at berberine and T cell differentiation in experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis. We're going to take genetically normal mice. If you recall from our prior discussion in the immune dysregulation DVD series, I presented a study where if you take troponin, that's a cardiac protein, and immunize mice with it, they will develop a Th1, Th17 immune response against the heart and develop a cardiomyopathy. Well, here what we're going to do, we're going to immunize the mice with MOG, myelin oligodendrocyte glycoprotein, and that will bring on a Th1, Th17 immune attack against the brain tissue, which is essentially the experimental model of multiple sclerosis. So we're going to take these mice, treat them with berberine distilled water three days before or nine days after you induce um, this experimental multiple sclerosis. And you're going to look at disease severity and you're going to evaluate the spinal cord pathology and immune uh, histopathology. 
And what you see berberine pre-treatment or post-treatment following um, induction of the experimental uh, multiple sclerosis is blunted with berberine. The spinal cords look a lot better in the berberine animals. And if you look at the um, T helper cells and the antigen presenting cells, there is a blunting of T helper cells. So there's fewer TH1, TH17 um, helper cells, uh, inflammatory lymphocytes in the brain tissue, and there are fewer antigen presenting cells that are biased towards this inflammatory TH1, TH17 pathway. If you take splenocytes, those are immune cells residing in the spleen, and you stimulate them to proliferate, you see lower expression of ROR gamma T. That's the transcription factor for TH17 lymphocytes. You see less T-bet. That's the transcription factor for TH1 lymphocytes. You know, we're working at the level of transcription factors. If we can block activation of a transcription factor, we can block all of its downstream mediators. And this is the beauty of nutritional medicine because we're working within Mother Nature's pathways. We don't have to block a number of enzymes with a number of different drugs. We block their activation. What we see is we block activation of queen jadis, um, ICPA kinase, in the antigen presenting cells, by, and then we're going to have fewer um, inflammatory um, cytokines. So berberine blocks nuclear factor kappa beta translocation in the antigen presenting cells, the dendritic cells, less IL-6, less IL-1 beta, and we attenuate T cell activation towards the inflammatory TH1, TH17 lineage. These are the types of T cells that mediate heart failure, atherosclerosis, and multiple sclerosis in humans, and experimental multiple sclerosis in this animal model. Now, T cell differentiation pathways, whether your T cells are going to be T regulatory cells to blunt inflammation, um, TH1 or TH17 cells that promote inflammation is determined by a number of different factors. The antigen presenting cells, the dendritic cells, they, they recognize there's an invader, they hightail it to the lymph node, and they will activate uncommitted or naive T cells. Um, and th which way they want to go is determined by the inflammatory milieu. If the lymph node, if our circulation is rich in inflammatory mediators, such as interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, we're going to go more towards the TH1, TH17 milieu than a Treg milieu. Um, let's look at berberine and type 1 pathogenesis. Now, type 2 diabetes, which is what 90% of our patients have, is insulin insensitivity. The pancreas is making plenty of insulin. Diabetes type 1 or juvenile or childhood diabetes, the, the pancreas has been damaged. The islet cells that generate insulin are dysfunctional or dead, and you suffer from lack of insulin. We're gonna, here we're going to look at 11-week-old female nod mice. Now, these are genetically abnormal mice that are predisposed to type 1 diabetes. Over time, they will all go into type 1 diabetes. So at the time of the study, none were frankly diabetic. Their sugar was not above 250. You're going to treat them over two weeks with berberine or distilled water and evaluate for progression to type 1 diabetes, which is felt to be inevitable in the nod mice. And you can see that berberine treatment blended progression of diabetes. All the nod mice went on to develop diabetes due to ongoing immune attack against the pancreatic islet cells, but there was great protection with berberine. 70%, 77% of the berberine versus 45% of the control islets were free of lymphocytic infiltration. So just as berberine was helpful against experimental multiple sclerosis, it was helpful in this animal model of genetic type 1 diabetes, which is inflammatory mediated TH1, TH17. If you look at the levels of the inflammatory cytokines, IL-17, IL-6, interferon gamma, tumor necrosis factor alpha, they were much greater in the control animals than in the berberine-treated animals. Berberine was blunting the inflammatory response. Through a number of different pathways, berberine works to blunt TH17, blunt TH1, less type 1 diabetes, less autoimmune disease in general, less cardiovascular disease in general. Now, let's talk a little bit more about diabetic end organ damage. We've talked about the beneficial effects of, of berberine and diabetes. We make more insulin receptors. Intracellular insulin signaling is um, improved. And we've been talking about the anti-toxicity, anti-inflammatory effects of berberine. In our prior presentation, we discussed benefits of berberine in diabetic nephropathy and retinopathy. That's diabetic kidney and eye disease. In our next section, we'll talk about diabetic cardiomyopathy 
here we'll talk about diabetic neuropathy, which our sleigh driver has because he's eaten too much Turkish Delight. So here we're going to do a cell culture study with human neural cells. We're going to incubate them in tissue culture with physiologic glucose, 5 millimolar, that's a normal blood sugar or an intracellular sugar, physiologic glucose with increasing dose of berberine, pathological hyperglycemia mimicking severe diabetes or the severe diabetic situation with concomitant berberine treatment, look at effects of normal sugar, high sugar with or without berberine on cell viability and markers of oxidative stress. Now, berberine had no adverse effect on cell survival. Berberine's not toxic to our cells unless we go to ridiculously high doses that we would not ever achieve in clinical medicine. However, as we raise the blood sugar level within the cells above normal, we see a reduction in cell survival. The cells are dying. They're committing apoptosis in response to this hyperglycemic situation. LDL, LDH release from the cells, and then there's the cell membranes erupting, they're dying, is brought on by the high sugar, and there's a reduction, there's a protection in a dose-related fashion with berberine. This is a marker of oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is occurring in response to the hyperglycemia. You can see it's being blended with berberine. Cell survival is only 65% at, with high sugar without berberine, and it's 100% high sugar with berberine. So berberine is protecting these cells from cell death, oxidative stress, cell membrane rupture that is being brought on by high sugar. Apoptosis, 48% of the cells, this is being blunted with berberine. Beckel II expression, that is an anti-apoptotic marker, is lost with the high sugar, protected with berberine, leakage of cytochrome C from the mitochondrion of the cell fluid, and apoptotic phenomenon is enhanced with the high sugar. It's blended with berberine. Um, now let's look at the pathway of berberine and uh, neuroprotection against hyperglycemia. The insulin growth factor one, insulin receptor, when it's activated, it will activate PI3 AKT, which will then activate another molecule called GSK3 beta. And this pathway is involved in cell growth protein synthesis, and we've talked about it before, this is the pathway of insulin signaling and glucose transport. When insulin binds the insulin receptor, we have this downstream chain reaction of tyrosine phosphorylation of these, of, of these intracellular um, enzymes, these molecules, that help promote the anabolic um, effects of insulin. So in response to activation of this pathway, we, our cells will express the GLUT4 receptor that will bring sugar into the cell, and it will be used for good purpose. And this will block the um, generation of free fatty acids. It will promote storage of excessive sugar in, in, as, as glycogen. It will do good things. This anabolic pathway through which insulin signaling occurs is also involved in cell protection. So IGF-1, AKT, GSK-3B, so here we're going to look at the effects of berberine. We'll increase expression of the IGF receptor a little bit at a low dose, but a lot more at a high dose. Just as berberine increases expression of the insulin receptor, it's increasing expression of the uh, insulin growth factor 1 receptor. This is blunted with hyperglycemia, just as hyperglycemia will downregulate expression of insulin receptors, it downregulates the, the expression of the IGF-1 receptors, and of course, there's rectification with berberine. Phosphorylation of AKT, which is involved in insulin signaling, is increased with berberine. Phosphorylation of GSK3 beta, which is involved in insulin signaling, is increased with berberine, and it's lost with pathological hyperglycemia. But pathological hyperglycemia with berberine, there's rectification, there's preservation of, of insulin signaling. So berberine is overcoming the deleterious effects of hyperglycemia on this insulin signaling anabolic, and as we'll soon see, cell protection pathway. AG1024 inhibits IGF-1 receptor function. We look at cell survival. Cells don't look so good with high sugar. High sugar in berberine, there's preservation. But if you knock out the IGF-1 receptor, berberine no longer is helpful. So IGF receptor function is involved in berberine protection against hyperglycemia-induced neural cell death, neurotoxicity.
NERF-2 translocation. We're going to discuss NERF-2 in detail in a, in a, in a, a few slides uh, further, but NERF-2 is a transcription factor for antioxidant and antitoxicity enzyme systems. Now you can see that berberine increases NERF-2 translocation. That's a good thing. You can see that high sugar does the same, but to a lesser degree. High sugar and berberine, there's even more. Heme oxygenase 1, which is a key antioxidant molecule coded for by NERF-2, and heme oxygenase 1 inhibits Queen Jadis, ICPA kinase. It's increased in a dose-related fashion with berberine. It's increased with glucose. So, you know, hyperglycemia is a bad thing, but it's inducing a compensatory anti-inflammatory rebound phenomenon, and the greatest expression of, of heme oxygenase 1 occurs with hyperglycemia and berberine. There's a synergy there. Nerve growth factor is necessary to maintain viability of nerve cells. It is lost with hyperglycemia, but there's rectification with hyperglycemia and berberine. If we look at heme oxygenase 1 and nerve, two, and nerve growth factor, both are, are cell pre preservation um, enzymes. They are increased with berberine, but if you knock out NERF2 with a silencing interferon, interfering RNA that knocks out NERF2, berberine no longer helps. So berberine neuroprotection and hyperglycemia is dependent upon translocation of this key antioxidant antitoxicity transcription uh, factor, NERF2. So hyperglycemia causes oxidative stress that leads to NERF2 translocation that codes for heme oxidase 1 and nerve growth factor. Berberine stimulates IGF-1, AKT, NERF2 translocation, heme oxygenase 1, and nerve growth factor. Berberine augments the antioxidant rebound to hyperglycemic oxidative stress. NERF2 is a key molecule to protect us from free radical stress and toxicity. We want our NERF2 molecules to be in the nucleus reading the DNA, and this is why we eat green vegetables and other colorful fruits and vegetables. The pigments in fruits and vegetables will translocate NERF2. This is why you want to have colorful fruits and vegetables all three meals a day, because it increases your ability to handle toxins and handle um, oxidative stress. Now, NERF2 stands for nuclear factor 2 erythroid factor 2. In case this ever comes up at a cocktail party, it's a cap and collar basic root region leucine zip or B-zip transcription factor. Now, so we're going to call it NERF2. It's a lot easier. NERF2 is made when the antioxidant responsive element, a section of the DNA, is activated. So we're going, to be make, we're going to be transcribing the messenger RNA of NERF2. It enters the cell fluid. It is translated into NERF2 protein. So we're constantly making the stuff at a low level, and it exists in the cell fluid only for 15 minutes because it will be bound to a molecule called KEEP1. And when KEEP1 sequesters or binds up NERF2, it associates it with COL3E3 ligase, which adds the ubiquitin molecule. When we add a ubiquitin molecule to a protein in our cells, that marks it for destruction, for degradation. So we're constantly making NERF2, but we're instantly tying it up and destroying it. Now, the names for all these molecules, I don't really understand their, their, you know, how they came up with NERF2, but I know how KEEP1 was named. Dr. Poling was involved in this research. He was working with Madame Wu in Shanghai. And as the story goes, in the morning, they isolated NERF2, then they went out for lunch. And Dr. Poling had some fish that wasn't well prepared, and he said he felt kelchy. So at, they went back to the lab, and as he was feeling kind of kelchy, he decided to name Keep1 Kelch like ECH associated protein 1. That's a true story. Um, so, anyways, NERF2 is made at a low level, and it's more or less instantly sequestered and degraded unless the cell experiences oxidative stress. If we experience oxidative stress and run out of antioxidants and glutathione, such as if you have high sugar, or there's a toxin, or you go for a brisk run and make some free radicals, the th thiol groups, SH groups, on KEEP1 will be oxidized, and KEEP1 falls apart. 
and it releases NERF2, free NERF2 can be phosphorylated by enzyme systems such as AMPK that's activated by berberine, and then the phosphorylated NERF2 enters the nucleus. It binds the promoter site of a section of DNA called the antioxidant responsive element and begins to crank out enzymes involved in detoxification. Our phase two detox enzymes are coded by the ARE and antioxidant defense, cell repair, cell cycle arrest, apoptosis, and more NERF2. So in this situation, when the cell is being assaulted by any sort of toxin or oxidative stress, we start translocating NERF2 into the nucleus, making defense molecules and making more NERF2 so we can augment our antioxidant antioxidant defenses. Which is why we don't want to wipe out oxidative stress completely. Because we need a little bit of oxidative stress in our life to translocate NERF2. Many of our therapies treat you with brief oxidative stress, hyperbaric oxygen, ultraviolet blood irradiation, going out for a run gives you transient oxidative stress, and then you get this profound antioxidant, antitoxicity rebound via translocation of NERF2, which is why in some of our prior studies, when you give really high doses of berberine, it doesn't provide the same amount of protection. So we want to lower oxidative stress, we want to modulate it, but we don't want to knock it out completely because we need a little bit of oxidative stress for NERF2 translocation. Now, how do we induce NERF2? Any toxins, reactive oxygen species like superoxide or hydrogen peroxide, um, uh, inflammatory nitric oxide, oxidized LDL, oxidized phospholipids in LDL, insufficient oxygen, too much oxygen, ischemia, reperfusion injury, TH1, TH17 cytokines, toxins, heavy metals, organic pollutants, phthalates, will all lead to a compensatory NERF2 translocation. Nutritional supplements. Many supplements will fool the body into thinking we're experiencing toxic stress. They're not toxic, but they initiate NERF2 translocation, so you augment your antioxidant defenses, your antitoxicity defenses. Green vegetables, broccoli is rich in sulforaphane, um, selenium compounds, phenolic compounds, curcumin, which is turmeric, ECGC, epicatechin gallate, which is found in tea and coffee, rosemary, red onion, thyme, coffee, carotenoids, melatonin, resveratrol, berberine, and laminar flow. This is how exercise protects us against cardiovascular disease. Have you ever wondered why cardiovascular disease is focal? And why do we see it after branch points? No one could explain this to me when I was training. Well, as it turns out, we need laminar uniform pulsatile flow to activate NERF2 and PK and nitric oxide synthase. This is how exercise works. This is how external counter... If you have inoperable heart disease, we'll treat you with passive exercise, external counterpulsation. This is how we improve endothelial function and protect against heart disease. Beyond branch points, there's a loss of laminar flow and you get this oscillatory, oscillatory flow and you don't activate these key protective enzymes. This is why our weakest link, the site of initial endothelial dysfunction atherosclerosis is beyond branch points. So laminar flow activates NERF2, nitric oxide synthase, and AMPK. So when we activate NERF2, we will change the way we read, it, read our DNA to make heme oxygenase 1, which converts heme, a component of hemoglobin, into bilirubin. And in this bilirubin, acts as an antioxidant, and heme oxygenase 1 specifically inhibits queen jadis. So it keeps queen jadis phosphorylated dicopakinase from releasing nuclear factor capillate in the nucleus. That's a big deal. NADPH quinone reductase, NQO1, blocks quinone oxidation. It's a kind of a final common pathway antioxidant. The enzymes that are involved in recycling glutathione are key intracellular antioxidant and detoxifier upregulated. Periredoxins, thioreduction, um, enzymes involved in phase two detox, and key enzymes such as superoxide dismutase and catalase, our initial antioxidant defense enzymes are upregulated uh, with NERF2 translocation. Let me, why is superoxide dismutase important? We're gonna take 40 subjects, 20 patients with coronary disease and abnormal stress studies, 20 healthy controls. We're gonna measure superoxide dismutase following a brief oxidative challenge, which is going for a run. You run them on the treadmill. You're going to generate a little bit of oxidative stress. 
And um, at baseline, you can see the patients had less superoxide dismutase. That's why they were patients. They couldn't prevent oxidative stress within the artery wall. They couldn't keep their LDLs from getting oxidized and the phospholipids from being oxidized. Now with exercise, there's going to be some oxidative stress, some nerve 2 translocation, but the antioxidant rebound is much greater in the healthy people than in the patients and the antioxidant rebound is lost pretty, pretty quickly in the patients, but it's, it's maintained in the healthy people. This is why exercise is good for you. It promotes your antioxidant defense systems by translocating NERF2. The problem, the coronary patients have a weak NERF2 um, pathway due to uh, poor nutrition, long-standing oxidative stress, et cetera. So back to berberine and neural protection. We're going to take mouse-derived um, neural cells and tissue culture. We're going to incubate them over 24 hours with increasing doses of berberine, evaluate effects on insulin and annex and defense signaling pathways, which in a sense are one and the same. With berberine, we see increased expression of the insulin receptor, increased tyrosine phosphorylation of the downstream enzyme AKT. We see translocation of NERF2 and its work product hemoxygenase 1, glutathione reductase, superoxide dismutase. Berberine is cranking these things out via translocation of NERF2. The pathway is berberine, the insulin, the insulin growth factor receptor, PI3KAKT nerf 2 AGE1024 blocks the IGF1 receptor, LY204 blocks PI3KAKT. Uh, if we look at protein expression of AKT, hemoxygenase 1 and nerf 2 we increase this with berberine, but if we block the IGF1 receptor, we block PI3K, we don't we don't achieve that goal. So this pathway needs to be intact. This insulin signaling pathway is also our detox uh, defense oxidative stress pathway, and it needs to be intact for berberine to improve insulin sensitivity and to translocate NERF2. Um, now we're going to take a murine uh, neural cells and tissue culture. We're going to incubate them over 20 minutes with vehicle, those are control cells, berberine, and then we're going to expose to hydrogen peroxide a free radical at, for, at a high level for long periods of time, one, two, or three days. Analyze cell viability and annex and defense integrity. LDH is released. The cells are dying from this, this, this powerful oxidative stress, but there's dose-related protection with berberine. The mitochondria are dying. They're becoming dysfunctional. They can't make ATP. This, in response to oxidative stress, this is being blended with berberine. If we look at NERF2, it rises a little bit with oxidative stress. Well, we know when we have oxidative stress, keeps going to let go and NERF2 is going to translocate, but we see a, a, a synergy between oxidative stress and berberine with respect to NERF2 translocation. And corresponding, we would see um, the same situation with the work product of NERF2, hemoxygenase 1. SMN is motor neuron protein, which is critical for the viability of nerve cells. It is lost as in consequence to hydrogen peroxide oxidative stress, but it's preserved with hydrogen peroxide and berberine. Beckel, which is an anti-apatotic molecule, is lost with hydrogen peroxide, but it's preserved with peroxide and um, uh, berberine. Oxygen consumption, a marker of free radical generation, rises with the oxidative stress of peroxide. It's blended with berberine. JC1 uh, ring red, green, red green fluorescence is a marker of mitochondrial failure. You see the mitochondria failing due to oxidative stress in the peroxide, and this is ameliorated with berberine. Cytochrome C translocation, which is uh, uh, involved in apoptosis, Bax expression, the activation of the executioner enzyme is rising with oxidative stress, and there's protection with berberine. We can sort of look at this as the balance of redox power. This is from our article on phenomena that promote and protect against diabetic neuropathy. You have hyperglycemia, you're going to get oxidative stress, all kinds of inflammatory pathways are activated, they're going to make reactive oxygen species, superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, free radicals. And that's going to activate nuclear factor kappa beta and activator protein 1. And we also know that oxidative stress will lead to translocation of NERF 2 with a compensatory antioxidant rebound. And whether the cells die or not depends upon the integrity of your NERF2 rebound. So if you're really good at translocating NERF2, you will defend yourself against oxidative stress 
do secondary to hyperglycemia. Now, when we have inflammatory and oxidative stress, we're going to activate Queen Jadis and nuclear factor kappa beta. We're going to make all these inflammatory cytokines. Concomitantly, we're going to downregulate NERF2. We're going to decrease glutathione. We're going to decrease catalase. We're going to decrease superoxide. Because, you know, if we're fighting a real infection, who needs antioxidant enzymes? Who needs uh, toxicity defense enzymes? We want bullets to kill the bacteria. The problem in long-standing diabetes is we're not killing bacteria, we're killing uh, nerve cells. So if you are, if you are good at, at translocating NERF2, you're going to make heme oxygenase 1. Heme oxygenase 1 specifically inhibits Queen Jadis. So if you're making a lot of heme oxygenase 1 from NERF2, you're going to keep nuclear factor kappa beta from translocating. You're going to shut down that inflammatory response. Conversely, when you translocate nuclear factor kappa beta in the nucleus, one of its particles, P50, actually associates with NERF2 and promotes its degradation. Again, when you have a real infection going on, you don't want to make antioxidants, you want to make bullets. Conversely, when you want to quiet down the infection, when you want to quiet down the inflammation, you want NERF2 to make hemoxygenase 1 to quiet down of the nuclear factor kappa beta pathway. So it's sort of a balance of powers. We want, we want to be able to fight infection, but we want to be able to quiet it down. Berberine, as, we, as we've seen, doesn't prevent us from in fight, fighting infection, but it will quiet it down. So you have less collateral damage when you're fighting a bacteria and through this same pathway, you're protecting against toxins, against chemotherapy, against ischemia reperfusion injury, here against hyperglycemia. Agents that translocate NERF2, curcumin, which is turmeric, melatonin, resveratrol, sulforaphane, berberine, are beneficial in, in dealing with diabetic neuropathy via NERF2. Let's talk about AMPK, NERF2 anti-inflammatory crosstalk. We're going to take human macrophages, white cells, monocyte-derived macrophages. ChHP1 cells are commercially available um, human monocyte-derived stimulated um, macrophage cell line. Another one is from, you obtain from mice, a murine source, a raw 264.7, or you could get fresh macrophages by irrigating the peritoneal cavity of a mouse. You're going to take these um, macrophages, pre-treat them for two hours with vehicle, a control group, low or high dose berberine, then incubate for 24 hours lipopolysaccharide, record the inflammatory and oxidative response. Now in the GHP, GHP1 monocytes, with lipopolysaccharide, we see IL-6, COX-2, INOS, inflammatory mediators, and we're going to blunt this with berberine. In the raw 264.7 macrophage, see the same thing, IL-1-beta, 2-numerocrosis factor alpha, the work product of nuclear factor kappa beta, you're seeing translocation of nuclear factor kappa beta in the nucleus in response to lipopolysaccharide. We expect that. Um, nitric oxide generation, and this is inflammatory nitric oxide, is kicked in with lipopolysaccharide. We blunt that with berberine. Markers of oxidative stress are increased with lipopolysaccharide. We blunt that with berberine. Mitochondrial failure is occurring with lipopolysaccharide. We block that with berberine. Glutathione S transferase is involved in using glutathione to quell the oxidative fire is um, lost with lipopolysaccharide, but dramatically augmented. Berberine plus lipopolysaccharide dramatically augments this rebound antioxidant response. Again, lipopolysaccharide will generate some oxidative stress that will release NERF2 from keep. Berberine via AMPK phosphorylates NERF2, so we get a synergy. Um, NQO1 and hemoxidase 1 work products of NERF2 are, are affected slightly by berberine lipopolysaccharide. Again, we see this big synergy. Same thing with hemoxygase 1. Nuclear, uh, NERF2 nuclear translocation rises a little bit with berberine, but it rises a lot with the combination of berberine and lipopolysaccharide. Our anti-toxicity defenses are kicked in by any sort of inflammatory oxidative stress, and this rebound is dramatically enhanced with berberine because we're phosphorylating NERF2, moving it from the cytoplasm into the nucleus to make hemoxygase 1 um, uh, and other anti-inflammatory uh, enzyme systems. Oxidative stress is increased. It's blunted with berberine. But if you knock out 
NQO1, one of the enzymes coded by nuclear factor kappa beta, we don't have the same antioxidant effect with berberine. If we look at INOS, inducible nitric oxide that's making bullet nitric oxide, um, that rises with lipopolysaccharide, we blend it with berberine, but if you knock out NQO1, there's no benefit. Same thing with COX-2. So berberine's antioxidant and anti-inflammatory defense upregulation requires NERF-2. Without NERF-2, berberine does not provide the antioxidant anti-inflammatory defense. Compound C blocks activation of AMPK. Now, berberine will activate AMPK except when there's compound C. So COX-2, an inflammatory, you know, COX-2 converts arachidonic acid into thromboxanes and leukotrienes and matrix metalloproteinases. We don't want to see that. It's upregulated with lipopolysaccharide. We blend it with berberine. But if we knock out AMPK, it, we don't get the same protection. Lipopolysaccharide and berberine will make, you'll make a lot of NQO1 and hemoxygenase 1, the work product of NERF 2, but if we block out AMPK, nothing happens. So the pathway of berberine to translocate NERF 2 to increase our antioxidant and anti defenses requires AMPK. AMPK, you know, basically by activating, by phosphorylating AMPK, all the beneficial effects of berberine follows the metabolic effects and here the, the detoxification antioxidant effects. NERF-2 nuclear translocation is wiped out, it's blunted if we knock out um, AMPK. So it's berberine, phosphorylates AMPK, which phosphorylates NERF-2, nuclear translocation, hemoxygenase 1, um, NQO1, cell defense. If we look at NQO1, you'll make a lot of it with lipopolysaccharide plus berberine, but if you knock out AMPK, nothing happens. Carnitine palmitoyl transferase, this has to do with fatty acid metabolism. We want a lot of this. It helps us burn fatty acids. It's got nothing to do with detox. It will be activated by lipopolysaccharide and berberine, and if we knock out AMPK, it won't work. Nothing, berberine doesn't have any effects with that AMPK. Um, however, if we knock out NERF2, there's no effect. The metabolic effects of berberine are AMPK, but not NERF2 dependent. The detoxification, the antioxidant defense pathways require both AMPK and NERF2. So how does this all work? Lipopolysaccharide or any threat to the cell that's going to cause amplification of inflammation, we're going to activate queen jadis, nuclear factor kappa beta translocates to the nucleus. We're going to make all these cytokines have an inflammatory response that's going to, we're going to make, we're going to activate myeloperoxidase, we're going to activate um, NADPH oxidase, we're going to make a boatload of superoxide. Well, that will activate NERF2 to make hemoxygenase 1, glutathione, catalase to blunt the oxidative attack. Berberine, by activating AMPK, synergizes here. So berberine will augment our antioxidant antitoxicity rebound to any cellular insult. That's the beauty of berberine. Now, enough of this biochemistry. This is kind of difficult. Let's get on to some Turkish delight. You know, in allopathic medicine, we treat you with drugs that block an enzyme. They're metabolic poisons. And they block something bad, but they don't do anything good. If we block hmg coi reductase and it's activated, we'll quiet down hyperlipidemia and inflammation. That's a really good idea if you just had a heart attack. But then we're going to get side effects because Mother Nature didn't give us hmg coi reductase just to kill us. We need some cholesterol. If we block COX-2 with Biox, we get less pain, less inflammation, more heart disease. With nutritional therapy, particularly with berberine, we're not poisoning enzymes. We are inhibiting them. If berberine phosphorylates AMPK, which phosphorylates hmg coi reductase, we turn it off. Berberine will block the transcription of COX-2. It'll block the transcription of PCSK9. We're not poisoning enzymes. We're deactivating them. We're blocking their inappropriate generation. This is a much better way of providing medical care than poisoning enzyme systems. Um, you know, Turkish Delight tastes very good, and it comes in many different shapes and colors. And the problem with Turkish Delight is the more you eat, the more you want. 
The drugs that we prescribed you that are being advertised on TV are quite colorful, and they have these wonderful TV ads, and the pharmaceutical industry, to make it easier for you, is color coding them. Everybody knows what a purple pill is. Everybody knows what a blue pill is. Now you're coming and asking for the white pill. And the more of these pills you take, the better you feel short term, but the more you need. Because when we poison an enzyme system, inevitably we're going to have side effects that may not show up for 10 years. And then we just have to keep adding drug after drug after drug, more and more metabolic poisons. This is not the way to live. Um, the more we, We're giving you drugs to make you feel good so you don't have to change your behavior. Um, if you're eating poorly and you have gastroesophageal reflux, you should stop eating poorly. But instead, if I give you a purple pill, you'll feel good, you can keep eating poorly. So 10 years later, you get osteoporosis and heart disease, and then we have to give you open heart surgery or more drugs. This is not the way to live our lives. It's not the way to practice medicine. What we want to do is understand our physiology, understand how lifestyle affects our physiology, and use nutritional supplements to augment the benefits of lifestyle modification. Now, I prefer to follow an AMP-sensitive protein kinase way of life. I, I'm not starving myself, but I am not overeating. I'm going to exercise on a regular basis. I'm going to take berberine, and I'm going to encourage you to remove from your milieu inflammatory phenomenon. Deal with infection. Deal with leaky gut. Deal, uh, change your diet. Begin to exercise. Get rid of your visceral fat. Because you want to have an active AMP sensor protein kinase. Deactivation of AMPK is essentially the root cause of most of our diseases in Western uh, society. We want to upregulate this enzyme and have beneficial effects on lipids, glucose and weight, oxidative stress and inflammation, endothelial function, which we'll talk about in the next section, toxic protection, and promote apoptosis of malignant cells while preventing apoptosis of our normal cells in response to a stress. With berberine, we shut off superoxide production by NADPH oxidase. We keep nuclear factor kappa beta from transcoding the nucleus. We keep activator protein 1 from reading your DNA, and we upregulate NERF2 translocation, so we're making antioxidant and detox defense enzymes. Again, the, um, the, the, the leading predator of mankind over the last three years has been infection. We got very good at recognizing and responding to infection. We can't differentiate inflammation from diet, visceral fat, toxicity, infection, allergy, leaky gut from real inflammation of bacteria. So we activate HMG coil reductase. We start making cholesterol. We activate NADPH oxidase. We make superoxide so our white cells become killing machines. But instead of killing bacteria, they're killing the cells that line our arteries. We have inflammatory hyperlipidemia. The liver becomes a producer and exporter of cholesterol. Our monocytes engorge on cholesterol. So do our smooth muscles. All the cells of the artery walls in an inflammatory oxidative situation engorge with lipids. This is why we're seeing heart attacks in people with normal cholesterol. It's not just the cholesterol. It's how your body is handling the cholesterol with inflammation. We move it from the liver into the artery wall. We oxidize our lipids. They look like a bacteria. We're activating the immune system further. We get hyperglycemia and tissue damage in response to inflammation. Berberine can, can mitigate all this by activating AMP-sensitive protein kinase. When we activate AMPK, we physiologically downregulate HMG coil reductase. We stabilize the messenger RNA for the LDL receptor. We block PCSK9. We decrease your LDL. We decrease your fatty acids. We decrease your triglycerides. You make more insulin receptors. Insulin signal is improved. So diabetic control is improved. And we blunt hyperglycemia in response to inflammation. We help you with weight. We restrain NADPH oxidase. We make less superoxide. Nuclear factor kappa beta activator protein 1 translocation is blunted, while NERF 2 translocation is enhanced. We protect against tissue damage from oxidative stress, ischemia, toxins, apoptosis, and malignant cells is enhanced. We improve endothelial function and cardiovascular physiology, which we're going to talk about in the next section. Um, protection against malignancy, at least in animal models and in cell culture studies. Protection against cellular damage due to infection, chronic inflammation, ischemia, toxic substances, tolerance to radiation therapy is enhanced in humans. 
Um, how do we use berberine in lipid management? We start at 500 milligrams twice a day. We could advance to 1,500 or even 2,000 milligrams a day. There's a synergy with statins, Reggie's rice, polycosinol, and azitamide, which is the uh, pharmaceutical name for Zetia. And if you're struggling with your statin, you're having statin side effects, if I add in berberine, I can typically decrease your statin by 50%. You'll get the same lipid reduction, fewer symptoms with enhanced anti-inflammatory response. For hyperglycemia, we start at 500 milligrams twice a day. We can increase this tolerated. We need to watch as we might need to cut back on your insulin or your sulfonylureal therapy. For inflammation, we don't really have clear dosing guidelines, but I would start with 500 milligrams twice a day in advance to achieve a therapeutic uh, target. Concerns, 5% of you will have nuisance GI side effects, gas, cramping, uh, diarrhea, or constipation. Don't stop the berberine, cut the dose in half. In every study, when you had a side effect, you cut the dose in half. Hypoglycemia, inappropriately low sugar, if you're taking insulin and I improve in insulin sensitivity with berberine, that insulin's gonna start to work too well. We might have to back off on the dose to avoid hypoglycemia. There's been a single case report of reversible bradycardia low heart rate with berberine, which we'll talk about in the next section. And the next section, which will conclude the chronicles of berberine, is berberine in the treatment of cardiovascular disease, otherwise known as voyage of the plaque buster. This section deals with berberine in cardiovascular disease, or as I would describe it, voyage of the plaque buster. We entered Narnia through the wardrobe, took the path by the lamppost, and gained and hopefully retained a great deal of knowledge to do well for ourselves and for others. But we saw that not all was well in Narnia, and there was going to be an epic battle of good versus inflammatory evil. Countess Junk and Queen Ikba sought to sow discord and disharmony, while Sir Nerf promulgated equality and abundance and justice. And as the good people of Narnia understood the origins of evil inflammation oxidative stress, such they were able to vanquish forever Queen Jadis and Countess Junk. And this is what we need to do in dealing with cardiovascular disease. The leading cause of death in the history of mankind is perinatal sepsis, death due to infection surrounding childbirth. If we make it through childbirth, we are likely to die of another infectious agent before or soon after we reach um, reproductive maturity. We've gotten very good at recognizing and dealing with infection. So all abnormalities that our cells sense are looked at as another infection, and we can't differentiate inflammation from bacteria and viruses from inflammation from visceral fat, a bad diet, leaky gut, and environmental toxins. So Western man is in a state of chronic response to pseudo-infection, and when we have an infection, we need to make white cells. To make new white cells membranes, we need cholesterol, so we're going to activate HMG coil reductase to make cholesterol, and we need more than just cholesterol to fight this battle. We need inflammatory mediators. So we activate uh, rho kinase, which activates NADPH oxidase to make superoxide so our white cells can become killing machines, except in the situation of modern man, the superoxide is killing our cells, promoting atherosclerosis and other age-related degenerative conditions, and the key amplifiers of inflammation are transcription factors such as Queen Jadis activates nuclear factor kappa beta or Countess Junk activates activator protein 1. Um, all these inflammatory pathways are affected. We upregulate production of superoxide, we translocate nuclear factor kappa beta, we translocate activator protein 1, and we're blocking translocation of the anti-inflammatory antitoxicity NERF2. And we get inflammatory hyperlipidemia. With inflammation, the liver um, stops expressing LDL receptors that makes PCSK9. It becomes a producer and transporter of lipids to the periphery, cells within the artery wall, vascular smooth muscle, and monocytes esterify cholesterol into lipid droplets, and they engorge in lipids. This is why we're seeing heart disease in people with normal cholesterol. It's not just the cholesterol, it's how your body manages it. We oxidize our LDL. It looks to the immune system like it's a bacteria. It's incorporated via the scavenger receptor, more uh, amplification of the inflammatory response. And if we generate a lot of inflammatory cytokines, 
our immune cells are activated in a pro-inflammatory fashion. They become Th1 and Th17 that mediate autoimmunity and heart disease. We make fewer Treg cells that quiets this down. And we get disordered insulin signaling, which is a very good idea. If you're fighting a real infection, your white cells need sugar, but it's not a good idea if you're an overweight type 2 diabetic. Um, berberine works by mimicking a good lifestyle. If we limit our calories, we avoid overeating, if we're exercising on a regular basis, we phosphorylate, we upregulate AMPK with all of these attendant beneficial effects. We've been talking about the effects on lipids, glucose and weight, oxidative stress, inflammation, protection against toxicity, uh, uh, and promotion of apoptosis, suicide, and malignant cells. We'll talk about how berberine activates endothe endothelial function in, um, in this section. Um, when we activate um, AMPK with berberine, we're going to block NADPH oxidase, make less superoxide. We're going to block nuclear factor kappa beta translocation. We're going to block deleterious reading of the DNA from activated protein 1. We're going to promote nerve 2 translocation. Um, beneficial effects on lipids we've talked about. We physiologically downregulate the production of cholesterol. We increase the expression of the LDL receptor. We blunt PCSK9 that degrades the LDL receptor. So we're going to lower cholesterol by blocking ACC carboxylase. We lower fatty acid generation and um, lower triglycerides. We increase expression of the insulin receptor. We improve the integrity of the intracellular insulin uh, signaling pathway. And we're going to be protecting against hyperglycemia due to inflammation and oxidative stress, providing protection against the consequences of longstanding diabetes, which is really uh, the consequences of longstanding intracellular oxidative stress, protection against diabetic kidney disease, diabetic eye disease, neuropathy, and we'll discuss benefits in diabetic cardiomyopathy. Berberine helps with weight, lowers oxidative inflammatory stress. Endothelial function improves. Activated AMPK activates endothelial nitric oxide synthase that makes nitric oxide, which triggers its secondary messenger cyclic GMP, to provide the Teflon coating from our blood vessels to make sure they are dilated, to keep the vascular smooth muscles from proliferating, thickening up the plaque, and keeping our platelets from aggregating inappropriately. Nitric oxide also antagonizes Queen Jadis. It blocks activation, phosphorylation of ICPA kinase, so we're going to help keep nuclear factor kappa beta out of the nucleus. The adhesion molecules are blunted, so fewer white cells can bind to the artery wall. Endothelial progenitor cell count rises. Endothelial microparticle count falls. I will explain this. Vascular smooth muscle proliferation and matrix metalloproteinase activity is blunted. Um, physiologic effects, there's an endothelial independent vasodilatation as there is an endothelial dependent vasodilatation, and berberine's an ACE inhibitor, it blocks the conversion of angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2. Beneficial electrophysiologic effects, we block proliferation of vascular smooth muscle. This is important in preventing plaque uh, development or restenosis following balloon angioplasty or stent placement. Our arteries are more elastic. We blunt left ventricular hypertrophy in response to high blood pressure, protection against renal vascular disease. We blunt abnormal platelet reactivity, and we shunt prostaglandin metabolism away from thromboxane A2, which causes platelet activation and adherence. Um, endothelial function improves, elevated blood pressure may fall, protection, at least in animal models, against afterload induced, that's high blood pressure induced, left hypertrophy, heart failure, and renal injury, protection against restenosis. In humans that receive stents for an acute coronary event, there's lower cytokine elaboration, post-stenting and improved outcome, adverse event rate falls from 10% to 7%. In patients with heart failure, on maximal drug therapy, if you add in berberine, there's an increase in functional status and ejection fraction, decreased arrhythmia, and a significant improvement in outcome, lower emission rate, lower mortality rate, and berberine synergizes with and adds to standard pharmaceutical measures. Atherosclerosis begins when lipid particles infiltrate the artery wall, um, which actually is not a pathological process because every cell in the artery wall has an LDL receptor and it needs LDL as food. The problem occurs when the lipids infiltrate at a high level and they get trapped. 
Trapping occurs when their phospholipids are oxidized by phospholipases, and then the LDL clumps together. It can't swim out. Then the free radicals can oxidize it, and that will initiate the inflammatory response. Now, so lipid particles traverse the endothelium. This is favored by high numbers of lipids with small particle size. And the initial weak point will be beyond a branch where you have irregular shearing stress and poor laminar flow. We need laminar flow to activate AMPK, NERF2, and nitric oxide synthase. We lose that. We get endothelial dysfunction. So this is why atherosclerosis is focal, and we see it predominantly beyond branch points. Now, the rheologic behavior, the, um, the uh, physics of, of flow of the LDL particle is related to the quality of the phospholipids in its membrane. And if we're following a, a good diet, our phospholipids will be rich in unsaturated fatty acids. This is 1,2-dilinolenal phosphatidylcholine, which is a beneficial phosphatidylcholine. In fact, we use it in the treatment of cardiovascular disease because it promotes reverse cholesterol transport. However, if you follow a diet rich in dairy and animal protein, we're going to have a lot of arachidonic acid in our LDL membrane phospholipids. Now, phospholipases, which are upregulated with systemic inflammation oxidative stress, will break the bonds in the phospholipids. So what you get with phospholipase D, we get arachidonic acid and what's called a lysophosphatylcholine. Now, the arachidonic acid, which we get from meat and dairy, enters the eicosanoid pathway, and cyclooxygenase will convert it to the deleterious pro-inflammatory and platelet-aggregating um, uh, prostaglandins and thromboxanes. And lysophosphatylcholine in the artery wall initiates inflammation. Something is wrong. It's not supposed to be there. It causes oxidative stress. The endothelial cells begin to make adhesion molecules, and white cells are going to enter the endothelium to investigate because there's something wrong here. We're not supposed to have this lysophosphatylcholine in the artery wall. Um, so let's look at the effect of berberine on oxidative stress induced by lysophosphatylcholine in vascular wall smooth muscle cells. So we're going to take vascular smooth muscle cells from the thoracic aorta of genetically normal rats. And again, we do not want proliferation of these smooth muscle cells. We see this, it bulks up the plaque, and we see it in restenosis. So we're going to take these vascular smooth muscle cells in tissue culture for two days without additives, with lysophosphatylcholine, which is going to initiate oxidative stress, with or without a one-hour pretreatment with berberine. And we're going to examine the lysophosphatylcholine and berberine effects on vascular smooth muscle proliferation and migration, free radical generation, and um, inflammatory mediator activity. So with the lysophosphatylcholine, we get abnormal proliferation and migration of vascular smooth muscle cells. That would be deleterious with respect to plaque formation or restenosis following stent placement. Now, what happens is the lysophosphatylcholine activates an enzyme called ERK-1-2. So we see an upregulation of ERK-1-2 with lysophosphatylcholine that is blended with berberine. Now, this might confuse you a little bit. It sure confused me because ERK-1-2 is the pathway through which berberine stabilizes the messenger RNA of the LDL receptor. There it's a good guy. Here it's a bad guy. The answer to this is there's many different ERK-1-2 enzyme systems in our physiology, and there's not a common nomenclature. So here, this is sort of a, a bad ERK-1-2, whereas with respect to berberine's effect on the LDL receptor, it's, it's a good ERK-1-2. But it just shows that um, lysophosphatylcholine is activating ERK-1-2, and that is responsible for the vascular smooth muscle proliferation because what it's doing is it's translocating activator protein 1, and it's generating reactive oxygen species. So lysophosphatylcholine causes oxidative stress, activates ERK-1-2, translocates um, uh, activator protein 1. This is the work of Countess Junk. You get vascular smooth muscle proliferation and migration. Berberine antioxidant effect blocks this pathway because berberine activates AMPK that translocates NERF2 that makes an, an, our antioxidant system. So berberine will block this um, oxidative stress um, phenomenon leading to proliferation of vascular smooth muscle cells. 
In addition, berberine is a vasodilator. If you infuse it at lower high doses into genetically normal rats, blood pressure falls. It's a vasodilator. If we infuse angiotensin 1, it will be converted to angiotensin 2, which is a potent vasoconstrictor. Um, but berberine will block that, just like an ACE inhibitor. So ACE inhibitors block the conversion of weak angiotensin 1 into powerful vasoconstrictive angiotensin 2. We give you ACE inhibitors to block that. Berberine does the same thing. Berberine, in dose-related phenomenon, blocks angiotensin-converting enzyme activity. If you strip away the endothelial layer of the artery or you, you neutralize nitric oxide synthase with a synthetic ADMA, an anti-nitric oxide synthase, berberine causes less vasodilatation. This is showing us that berberine is working at the level of the endothelium. Acetylcholine is the most potent chemical to generate nitric oxide in its second messenger cycle GMP. You can see that berberine has a similar effect. At high dose, it does it does just as good a job of cranking out cyclic GMP as does acetylcholine. So berberine stimulates nitric oxide synthase and blunts vascular smooth muscle proliferation. Let's look at berberine and platelet physiology. We're going to take um, 32 genetically normal New Zealand white rabbits. We're going to administer intravenous berberine and evaluate platelet aggregation 30 minutes post IV berberine. If you expose platelets to ADP, you get platelet aggregation, 58% in control situation, and this is blunted with berberine, again, in a dose-related fashion. If you keep your platelets from aggregating, you're going to have less microclots forming. Um, this would, would, would protect you against coronary occlusion. This would protect you against um, stent thrombosis after stent placement. Um, platelet aggregation due to collagen and arachidonic acid is blunted with berberine. Now, we're going to evaluate platelet thromboxane A2 formation, thromboxane A2, we're going to measure thromboxane B2 is the stable end product so we can measure thromboxane A2. We have arachidonic acid that is released from the cell membrane by um, uh, phospholipases, cyclooxygenate converts it to PGH2, PGA2, thromboxane A2 down to thrombox, thromboxane A2 synthase down to thromboxane A2 causing platelet aggregation. So we're going to um, co-incubate with saline, that's a control. As a positive control, we use a pharmaceutical thromboxin A2 synthase inhibitor called Tixi or Berberine, and you can see that thromboxane B2 formation with ADP is blunted dramatically if we knock out thromboxane A2 synthase. Berberine does nearly the same thing again in a dose-related fashion. Thromboxane B2 formation with collagen is blocked by the inhibitor of, of the synthase, and berberine does a better job. The inhibitor does a better job of blocking thromboxane B2 formation with arachidonic acid, but berberine still has a positive effect. So berberine has an antiplatelet effect, an aspirin-like effect. Berberine and experimental restenosis. Um, following balloon angioplasty or stent placement, oxidative stress, vascular smooth muscle proliferation, and platelet aggregation all play a role in restenosis. We've shown that berberine blocks platelet aggregation, it blocks inflammation, it blocks proliferation of vascular smooth muscle, it blocks platelet aggregation. Would berberine be helpful? Well, this was a cell culture study. We're going to take vascular smooth muscle cells from genetically normal rats, and we're going to culture them with growth factors. These are mitogenic factors that would cause vascular smooth muscles to proliferate and migrate. Angiotensin II, a molecule called heparin binding epidermal growth factor, basic fibroblast growth factor. These are mitogenic for vascular smooth muscle cells. They will cause them to proliferate and migrate with or without berberine pretreatment. And you can see that berberine is not toxic itself to the cells until you get to high doses that we would not achieve in clinical medicine. The rate of proliferation and DNA synthesis of the vascular smooth muscle cells to these mitogenic stimuli, the growth factors, um, epidermal growth factor, um, and angiotensin II is blunted with berberine. Again, we're blunting DNA synthesis because what does berberine do? It activates AMPK. What does AMPK do? It slows down the rate of cell division in cells that are dividing too rapidly by creating G1 uh, cell cycle arrest. So we're going to block this abnormal proliferation of vascular smooth muscle cells that would play a role in restenosis. The cells are less likely to migrate. 
um, and they don't migrate as far. So we're slowing them down a little bit. So what that would, in this cell culture study, it's blocking the mitogenic stimulation of proliferation of vascular smooth muscle cells. Now let's look at an animal model. We're going to take genetically normal rats, treat them for four weeks with berberine or a vehicle control group, and we're going to create carotid artery endothelial injury. What we're going to do, you put in a balloon catheter and you blow it up and you deflate it and you rough up the endothelium. So you're going to be damaging the endothelium and the body's going to respond with a repair mechanism. This is called neointimal uh, formation, which is an experimental model of restenosis following balloon angioplasty. So at 28 days, you're going to look at the carotid segments and there is a ingrowth of smooth muscle cells and fibrous tissue. We call this neointimal formation and it is blunted by berberine. And that makes sense because it's going to block the proliferation of vascular smooth muscle cells, block platelet aggregation, block oxidative stress. Now let's look at berberine and experimental renal vascular disease. We're going to take genetically normal rats. We have control rats with sham surgery, standard diet, with or without berberine. And then we create a single, single kidney atherosclerotic disease model. We give them a high cholesterol, high fat diet. We take out one kidney. In the remaining kidney, you put a coil in the renal artery to cause a stenosis and you'll confirm that blood flow to the remaining kidney is compromised. We call this renal artery stenosis, and kidney function will deteriorate, and this oxygen-starved kidney will release renin and, that will uh, lead to uh, the generation of angiotensin II and aldosterone, so you'll vasoconstrict, you retain salt, you'll develop hypertension, eventually heart failure. So we're going to create this experimental renal vascular disease model uh, with or without um, co-treatment with berberine, you're going to sacrifice all the animals for 12 weeks, look at the kidney under the microscope, look at the lab values. So the control animals, with or without berberine, the blood pressure is normal. Those with the renal vascular hypertension that did not receive berberine, their blood pressure rises, it doesn't change. There's a rise in blood pressure with renal vascular stenosis, but then if you treat them with berberine, that hypertension is blunted. Body weight increases with renal vascular disease due to fluid retention, and this is blunted with berberine. LDL will rise with the bad diet, that's blunted with berberine. Triglycerides rise with the bad diet, that's blunted with berberine. Serum creatinine, our muscles are making creatinine, is excreted through the kidney. As your kidney function deteriorates, we see a rise in creatinine. As you would expect, the creatinine rose because they only have one kidney, and it's its, it's blood supply is being compromised, and this was blunted with berberine. Urine albumin, that's proteinuria when the sieve is leaky, it rises with the experimental renal vascular uh, model, it's blunted with berberine. When I treat my patient with the berberine, I will see a reduction in your creatinine. If it's 1.5, it may go down to 1.4 or 1.3. If it's 1.2, it may go down to 1.0. Because if you're my patient, you probably are subject to oxidative inflammatory stress and hyperglycemic inflammation. And if I give you berberine and I crank up your antioxidant defense system by translocating NERF2 into the nucleus, yeah, I'm going to improve your creatinine with berberine. Free radical generation, reactive oxygen species, T-bars is a marker of oxidative stress. Of course, it's increased in the renovascular animals, and this is blended with berberine. We lose superoxide dismutase. We're making so much superoxide, we run out of superoxide dismutase. This is increased with berberine because we're translocating NERF. Now, here, I think the researchers made a mistake. They said that catalase, which is an antioxidant, rose with renovascular disease and fell with berberine. And I think they made a mistake because catalase, like superoxide dismutase, is coded for by NERF2. So I would have expected it to fall with the disease and rising with berberine. They didn't really comment. Maybe it was, it was something I don't understand or was some sort of compensation. But in any event, you can see that berberine rectified the abnormality brought on by the experimental renal vascular hypertensive model. If you look at the kidney cells under the microscope, they don't look so good in the renal vascular kidney, and they, they, there's better preservation of the architecture with berberine. Um, what you see is an upregulation of INOS, so you're making bullet nitric oxide, and you're making transforming growth factor beta. Again, that's promoting fibrosis as it did in the um, subjects with lung cancer that receive radiation therapy, or the animals that were put on the high alcohol diet 
high fat diet and receive carbon tetrachloride. Here it's a sign of scarring. It's blended with berberine. And again, what's happening here? We see our old friend, Queen Jadis. She's getting phosphorylated. We're going to translocate nuclear factor kappa beta into the nucleus, making all these inflammatory and oxidative mediators. This is blended by berberine. Berberine and experimental cardiac hypertrophy. Hypertrophy re refers to a thickening or enlargement of the heart muscle, which is deleterious. So we're going to take genetically normal rats and we're going to create experimental coarctation. Aortic coarctation is a congenital abnormality where there's a pinching in the aorta, so the heart must eject blood into this narrow tube and you get hypertension at the level of the heart and then left hypertrophy. So you're going to do this experimentally by putting a little band around the aorta. You're going to create experimental coarctation, so the heart's going to be subjected to high afterload stress. It will be, you'll be seeing high blood pressure. So you're going to create coarctation. You have a, control, a, a sham surgery control group. Four weeks post-surgery, you begin berberine or no treatment, and you're going to evaluate the physical physiologic biochemical effects at 8, 10, and 12 weeks. Will berberine blunt the deleterious effects of this afterload induced, this coarctation induced left ventricular hypertrophy? Now, what are the mediators of left ventricular hypertrophy? Cell enlargement. Norepinephrine, a sympathetic neurotransmitter, TH1 cytokines, angiotensin II, aldosterone, endothelin, IGF-1, when it's overly uh, elaborated, is mitogenic for the heart muscle. So we look at blood pressure rises with aortic banding, the systolic, and the mean pressure rises at four weeks. Okay, then at four weeks, they were randomized to receive berberine or the control substance, and you can see um, at six weeks, berberine's not really having an effect, but at eight weeks, it is. So you, you create the um, coarctation, and at four weeks, you get berberine or placebo. You can see with four weeks of treatment, the hypertension brought on by the experimental coarctation is blended with berberine. Contractility, the rate at which the heart squeezes down, and relaxation, the rate at which the heart can relax, both require energy. You can see they're blunted with this um, experimental hypertension but this is preserved with berberine. If the heart is stiff, the blood pressure in the heart will rise. That would make you short of breath. This occurs with aortic banding. It's blended with berberine. Body weight is decreased because these are sickly animals here, but that is preserved with berberine. The heart enlarges with this experimental hypertension, so the left ventricle weighs more, that's blended with berberine. The ratio of the left ventricle to body weight rises with the coarctation. It's blended with berberine. The left ventricle increases in weight because the sides are enlarging. If you lift weights, your muscle cells will enlarge. If the heart is asked to lift this weight, the cells will enlarge. The heart becomes stiff. This is deleterious. Plasma norepinephrine. Norepinephrine is a sympathetic nervous system neurotransmitter. The level in the plasma reflects the activity of the sympathetic nervous system. This is your fight or flight response. So these animals with the experimental coarctation had a lot of fight or flight. Plasma norepinephrine was high. This was blended with berberine. So we're blending the sympathetic nervous system response. Plasma epinephrine reflects activity of the adrenal. Your adrenal gland will release epinephrine in response to sympathetic fight or flight stimulation. It's cranked up with aortic banding. It's blended with berberine. Left ventricular norepinephrine reflects the, the preservation, the integrity of the sympathetic nerve terminals in the heart. In the aortic banded animals, there's a burnout of the sympathetic system, and the heart is sort of is giving up. It's failing. It's running out of norepinephrine. And this, there was no protection with berberine, but left ventricular epinephrine, which reflects epinephrine released by the adrenal medulla into the circulation that soaks into the heart, rose with aortic banding, aortic banding with berberine, there's protection. So we're blocking this fight or flight sympathetic response to experimental hypertension. So berberine in experimental hypertensive heart disease, antihypertensive effect, it lowers blood pressure, pathologic weight loss is prevented, contractility and relaxation is preserved, abnormal left hypertrophy and myocyte heart cell enlargement is blunted, plasma norepinephrine epinephrine is reduced, 
Myocardial norepinephrine depletion is not reduced. The sympathetic mitogenic response to elevated afterload is blunted, and we would expect that this would hold true in humans with hypertensive heart disease. Um, diabetic end organ damage, let's talk about diabetic ischemic arrhythmia, diabetic cardiomyopathy. We're going to take genetically normal rats, divide them into four groups. Standard control group, standard chow, no instrumentation. The ischemic group, they get a standard chow, and, and at eight weeks you ligate, you close off their left hand ascending, they're going to have a heart attack. A third group is rendered diabetic. You inject them with a pancreatic toxin called streptozidocin that's going to damage the pancreas. They become type 1 diabetic and they have a high sugar. So you render them diabetic and then you create a heart attack. So it's a diabetic heart attack model. The fourth group, they're rendered diabetic. They have the experimental heart attack, but they receive berberine, 100 milligrams per kilogram per day for one week before the heart attack. So they're diabetic, you treat them for a week with berberine, then create the heart attack, and then you look at the, the, their electrical integrity following the experimental heart attack. Now the control animals, they, their heart is normal, they don't have any arrhythmia. Those with the experimental heart attack have 165 seconds of arrhythmia the first 12 hours post heart attack. The diabetic animals are more electrically unstable following the experimental heart attack, and you can see that that's blunted with berberine. Rhythm complexity is worse than the diabetic animals. That's blunted if the diabetic animals are treated for one week with berberine. Your QRS is, um, we do not want to see a long QRS. That's a sign of dysfunction. And it rises with the heart attack. It rises more. There's two, more QRS lengthening with the, in the diabetic animals, and there's rectification with berberine. A prolonged QT interval reflects disordered repolarization. A long QT sets you up for an arrhythmia. We see that this is occurring following a heart attack, worse than the diabetic animals, and there's, this is rectified with berberine. These are inward currents that mediate the rate of heart cell depolarization, repolarization, and these are compromised with heart attack, even worse than the diabetic animals, and there's a rectification, um, nearly back to normal with berberine. So there's beneficial electrical, electrophysiologic effects of berberine. We would predict then that berberine would have antiarrhythmic activities in humans. First, let's look at berberine in diabetic cardiomyopathy. Genetically normal rats divide into four treatment groups, standard chow, standard water, a high fat, high uh, sugar diet, and then you render them type one diabetic. So bad diet, pancreatic failure, they're gonna have hyperlipidemia and diabetes, and then and exper experimental groups with low-dose or high-dose berberine, high-fat, high-sugar diet, you render them diabetic and treat them with berberine, you're going to evaluate all at, at 13th week. Stroke volume, the amount of blood you eject with each beat, is compromised in the diabetic animals with preservation with the in the diabetic animals treated with berberine. Cardiac output, the same phenomenon. The rate of change of pressure, your contractility, the squeeze of the heart, the ability to relax, which is energy dependent, is compromised in the diabetic animals. The diabetic animals treated with berberine, there's preservation. Left ventricular free wall thickness and collagen, a hypertrophy of the heart. Now, previously we caused heart left ventricular hypertrophy with afterload stress, experimental coarctation. Here we're causing abnormal hypertrophy with metabolic stress, hyperglycemia and hyperlipidemia. And this was blunted with berberine. Fasting glucose, of course, was high. You rendered them type 1 diabetic. This is blended with berberine. The same thing with cholesterol and triglycerides, as you would expect, and AMPK effect. Myocardial free fatty acid content. In diabetes, we do not want to see an accumulation of our organs of fatty acids, because this will aggravate insulin insensitivity. This occurred in the diabetic rats that was blended with berberine. Fatty acid transport proteins, the ability to burn fatty acids, is blunted in the diabetic high sugar, high fat uh, animals. This is blunted with berberine. This is a bit confusing here. PPAR alpha is a transcription factor that in the liver is a good guy. It helps you burn fats. But in the heart of a diabetic animal, it's a problem. It regulates fatty acid transport, esterification, binding, and beta oxidation. Um, it is overly expressed in type 1 and type 2 diabetes, 
and it produces deleterious effects. So it is overly expressed in the diabetic animals. The diabetic animals treated with berberine, this is blunted. PPAR gamma is expressed mainly in adipose tissue, and in a sense, it's a bad actor. It makes you fatter. The drugs we, that are PPAR gamma agonists, the thiazolene dions, they lower your sugar, but they cause visceral fat to accumulate. Well, in the diabetic heart, it's a good guy, and it is lost in the diabetic heart, and it's preserved with berberine. And the GLUT4 receptor, that's the receptor that allows your cells to internalize sugar. It's lost in the diabetic heart. There's rectification with berberine. So all these directional changes with transcription factors that are deleterious, that are brought on in the, in the diabetic animal model are, are mitigated with berberine. Now, let's look at berberine and homocysteine-induced hyperlipidemia. This is all new to me. I have not read before that homocysteine can lead to hyperlipidemia. We're going to take genetically normal rats, baseline measurements, and then feed them for four weeks standard rat chow, which is low in methionine. Methionine is the amino acid that is converted into homocysteine. Homocysteine is toxic to the artery wall. We want to, we want to help you metabolize homocysteine via enzyme systems that are B vitamin dependent. This is one of the reasons we give you B vitamins. So on a standard diet, they have a low, no, low homocysteine of four. Then another group gets a high methionine diet, set of 0.7%, it's 1.7%, and they have a very high homocysteine of 25. Normal is like nine to 11. Third group is rendered hyperhomocysteinemic, but they get berberine the final five days. Study the effects on lipids and gene expression. Serum cholesterol rises with the high homocysteine diet. High homocysteine diet with berberine, this is, there's protection. Hepatic cholesterol rises in the high homocysteine diet. With berberine, there's protection. So there's something about homocysteine that causes you to make more cholesterol in the liver and release it in the blood, and somehow berberine is blocking this. HMG coi reductase is the enzyme that when active, when upregulated, makes cholesterol. And you can see that there's more of it with the high homocysteine diet, and berberine has no effect. So the high homocysteine diet, you're making more HMG coi reductase, and berberine's having no effect. You are reading your DNA with the high homocysteine diet in such a fashion that you're making more HMG coi reductase. You're making more, and you, you're, you're transcribing more, and you're seeing more in the cell fluid. And nuclear sterile regulatory element binding protein, when it translocates into the nucleus, it's going to make HMG reductase. So there's something about the high homocysteine diet that's mimicking low intracellular cholesterol. It's fooling SCAP and it's allowing SREBP to go into the nucleus and bind to the DNA and you're cranking out HMG reductase inappropriately. So high homocysteine you're translocating SREBP inappropriately, you're making HMG reductase. you're going to make more cholesterol. Now, HMG reductase protein rises with a high homocysteine diet, and it's not affected by berberine. But if you look at HMG reductase activity, how fast the enzyme is working, it's blunted with berberine. Now, how is this possible? Well, it's not just the number of HMG coi reductase molecules in your cell fluid, it's their state of activation. AMPK protein kinase, it's a protein kinase. When it's activated by calorie restriction or exercise or berberine, it's phosphorylated. It, in turn, phosphorylates and downregulates HMG coi reductase. So if you look at the percentage of your HMG core reductase in the cell fluid that is inactive, that it's phosphorylated, that's decreased with, with homocysteine. So homocysteine is dephosphorylating HMG core reductase, turning it on. You're making more of it, you're turning it on, berberine is blocking that. So it's not preventing homocysteine from cranking out more HMG core reductase but it's keeping it inactive. And if it's inactive, it can't make more cholesterol. If you look at the number of AMPK protein molecules in the cell fluid, there's no change. But what you'll see, the high homocysteine diet, hyperhomocysteinemia, will deactivate AMPK. It acts like inflammatory cytokines or 
uh, overeating, of uh, uh, inflammation, and berberine will rectify that. So if we look at the activity of AMPK, which is the key mediator of our cardiovascular metabolic health, it's compromised by homocysteine. This is rectified by berberine. So berberine would be expected to lower homocysteine by blocking deactivation of AMPK that occurs with homocysteine just as it does with a high sugar, high fat diet inflammation. Liver chemistries rose with high homocysteine diet because you're making too much fat. This was blended with berberine. So homocysteine mimics low hepatic, low liver cholesterol, sterile regulatory element binding protein, goes to the nucleus, starts making too much HM reductase. Homocysteine deactivates, it dephosphorylates AMPK, so you're going to dephosphorylate or then activate HM reductase, make too much cholesterol, and you, you secrete it into the circulation, you have hyperlipidemia and fatty liver. Berberine activates AMPK, inactivates HM reductase, decreased cholesterol generation, secretion, resolution of fatty liver. Now we're going to look at it from the other way around, berberine and homocysteine. We're going to take genetically normal rats, we have control rats, standard housing, standard diet. High fat rats, they get, instead of a 12% fat diet, they get a 51% fat diet. Berberine rats are put on the high fat diet and treated with berberine, sacrifice, saw, and evaluate liver status in labs at 12 weeks. The high fat diet increased homocysteine. I was not aware of this. I'm not sure if it occurs in humans, but it's occurring in this intact animals model. This is blended with berberine. Body weight rises with the high fat diet. This is blended with berberine because berberine promotes the burning of fatty acids. Food intake was pretty much the same, maybe a little lower food intake with berberine. That's the hypothalamic effect, but berberine promotes burning of fatty acids as opposed to carbohydrates. So at an equivalent caloric intake, you would lose weight with berberine. We would expect that. Hepatic liver cholesterol rises with the high fat diet. Not much change by adding in berberine, but serum cholesterol rises a lot on the high fat diet. We blunt that with berberine, we would expect that. HMG reductase transcription, reading of the DNA, rises with a high fat diet. We blunt that with berberine. LDL receptor transcription is blunted with a high fat diet. We blunt this with berberine. APOE is involved in the signaling between the LDL receptor and the LDL. We want a lot of APOE that's lost with a high fat diet that's preserved with berberine. High fat diet leads to hyperhomocysteinemia. Hyperhomocysteinemia leads to hyperlipidemia. Both of these phenomena are blocked with berberine. Another good reason to take berberine to prevent or treat cardiovascular disease. Now, in, in our prior discussion, we talked about how berberine protects um, uh, tissue damage in kidney ischemia reperfusion injury. Cell survival following ischemia reperfusion is preserved with berberine. The cells experience less oxidative stress. They're better able to generate um, a rebound antioxidant defense system by translocating nuclear factor capillating the nucleus. So berberine would be expected to enhance our response of any organ to ischemia reperfusion. Here in the kidney, this has also been studied in um, neural cells and in intact gerbils. It hasn't been studied in the heart, but we would expect that if we looked at it, created an experimental heart attack in an animal, that there would be preservation of tissue with pretreatment with berberine. We would expect that. That study just hasn't been done. Berberine activates AMP-sensitive protein kinase. One of its benefits is to phosphorylate and activate nitric oxide synthase and improve endothelial function. Now, in, in the um, Fellowship in Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine, which is a training program in integrative medicine, and I participate in that, in one of our courses, we have a two-hour section called an intimal look at atherosclerosis. We talk about carotid intermediate thickness and endothelial function. We have a DVD on carotid intermediate thickness, and I'm working on one endothelial function. The endothelium, the cells that line the artery's wall, is a massive tissue the size of the liver. It's a biochemical factory. We want a dynamic and functional endothelium. If I crush my hand and it gets infected, I want my endothelial cells in my arm to activate. I want platelets to aggregate. I want the blood vessels to constrict so I don't bleed. 
I want the endothelial cells to elaborate adhesion molecules because I want my white cells to infiltrate the tissues and kill the bacteria. This will prevent me from experiencing infection or tissue loss if I injure myself. Conversely, I don't want this going on in my coronary arteries. I want to make a lot of nitric oxide. I want my vessels to dilate. I don't want the platelets to aggravate. So endothelial function, if it's dysfunctional, it's a very bad sign. Conversely, if your endothelium is healthy, this is a very positive prognostic sign. Pollings dictum, as goes the endothelium, so goes the patient, and Pollings corollary. Control the endothelium controls the cardiovascular destiny of the patient. Can we improve endothelial function with berberine? Now, berberine will activate AMPK, which activates nitric oxide synthase. You make nitric oxide with all kinds of positive biochemical and clinical effects. Let's look at the effects of berberine on endothelial progenitor cell count and arterial elasticity. We're going to take 15 healthy volunteers, people like me in their 50s, lean, none with diabetes, hypertension, smoking, hyperlipidemia, cardiovascular disease, healthy middle-aged people. You're going to look at blood pressure lab studies and endothelial progenitor cell count. Our bone marrow is kicking out endothelial replacement cells, endothelial progenitor cells, and they will repave our arteries. Our arteries are always sloughing off dead endothelial cells, and we need to repave them at an appropriate rate to maintain healthy endothelial tone. The rate of egress of these endothelial progenitor cells from the bone marrow reflects systemic endothelial function. If you're making a lot of nitric oxide, you're, it's, it's almost as if the artery wall is communicating with the bone marrow. So we're going to look at the endothelial progenitor cell count. Then we're going to look at arterial elasticity, large vessels and small vessels. Baseline studies in these healthy people, treat them all with berberine, 400 milligrams three times a day, reevaluate it 30 days. And you can see there was no significant effect on blood pressure, but it was quite normal to begin with. No effect on C-reactive protein, but it was quite normal to begin with. Fasting sugar fell a little bit more, so these normal people became a little bit more normal, and their lipids fell. So we like it when your sugar falls from 86 to 82, and your LDL from 120 to 91 with berberine that does all these good things for you and costs $30 a month. Um, Large vessel elasticity did not improve. Small vessel did. They hypothesized that if they had run the study longer, large vessel elasticity, which has to do with vascular smooth muscle cells and elastic fibers, it might have improved as well. But um, uh, small vessel elasticity improved, and you kicked out more endothelial progenitor cells. So these healthy people with out a lot of risk factors became healthier, their bone marrow started kicking out more endothelial progenitor cells in response to berberine. Another study of berberine and endothelial progenitor cells. 20 healthy volunteers do baseline measurements, treat them all with berberine, and repeat the baseline measures. So we've got stem cells in the bone marrow. They commit to endothelial progenitor cells. They enter the circulation. They bind to the endothelium, and they replace old cells to maintain endothelial function. We want to see a lot of endothelial progenitor cell activity. So with berberine, we see reductions in cholesterol and LDL, reductions in triglycerides, slight reductions in blood pressure, nice reduction from 100 to 80 in fasting sugar. The normal people became more normal, more healthy. And endothelial progenitor cell count rose the cells and tissue culture were more active. They were more likely to proliferate adhere to the endothelial surface, and become functional and make nitric oxide. And all these beneficial changes in endothelial progenitor cell counts and function correlated with increases in nitric oxide. So as we upregulate endothelial nitric oxide synthase, we improve endothelial function and the ability to repair the endothelium. Conversely, endothelial microparticles are apoptotic dead particles of particles released by dying endothelial cells. We don't want our endothelial cells to commit apoptosis, but they will in response to oxidative and toxic stress. So high levels of EMPs is a marker of endothelial dysfunction. We're going to take 23 healthy volunteers, no risk factors, mean age 53, they're all trim. Baseline measurement, standard risk factors, flow mid vasodilatation, and non-invasive assessment of endothelial function as we carry it in the office. You're going to look at the counts of these apoptotic dead endothelial cell particles, and we're going to look at malandialdehyde, a marker of oxidative stress at the level of um, the cell membrane. 
Baseline measurements, treat them all with berberine, 400 milligrams three times a day for three days, then you repeat the baseline studies. Again, these normal people had a normal cholesterol, it became more normal, their LDL fell, their fasting sugar fell. Endothelial function improved. So these normal people weren't as normal as they could be, they became more normal, you improve endothelial function. Endothelial microparticles, these dead apoptotic endothelial cell particles fell, evidence of oxidative stress fell. So less dead endothelial cells, less oxidative stress, and they showed that as malonaldehyde fell, as there's less oxidative stress, there's less toxicity to the endothelial, there's fewer, there's lesser release of these dead apoptotic cells. Now, berberine, endothelial microparticles, and oxidative stress. We're going to take human umbilical vein endothelial cells, normal cells and tissue culture, and we're going to stimulate them with vehicle, that's a control situation, endothelial microparticles, apocinin, which blocks NADPH oxidase and thus decreases superoxide, berberine, EMPs and the NADPH oxidase inhibitor, EMPs and berberine, and we're going to look at production of nitrite, which is a marker of beneficial nitric oxide. We're going to look at levels of free radicals, reactive oxygen species, and activity of NADPH oxidase, which, is the, which generates the lion's share of superoxide within the endothelial cells. So if you incubate the endothelial cells with the endothelial microparticles, there's toxicity of the endothelium. It's making less nitric oxide. Apocinin has no effect, but you can see that apocinin and berberine block the toxic effect of the endothelial microparticles on endothelial function. So the reduction in nitric oxide formation as measured by nitrate is blunted. Now, the endothelial microparticles are sick, apoptotic, dysfunctional cells, and they're, 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 they're full of, of enzyme systems like NADPH oxidase and myeloperoxidase that are generating free radicals, so we crank them up with the EMPs, and this is blunted with apocinin. It's blunted with berberine because apocinin blunts NADPH oxidase, which is upregulated in these dysfunctional, uh, dysfunctional dead endothelial cells. Both apocinin and berberine are blocking NADPH oxidase. They, bl they block free radical stress. Thus, there's less free radical stress to damage the endothelial cells to, to cause dysfunction of nitric oxide synthase. So the endothelial function in cell culture here is preserved. Now, when we activate NADPH oxidase, we generate superoxide, which is great when you're fighting a real infection, but it's disastrous when we're dealing with the pseudo-infection experienced by Western man, and berberine will block this. Now, let's look at berberine in humans, and, and can we improve endothelial function? This is a study of a nutritional cocktail. We talked about this before in our presentations on berberine and lipid control and diabetes control. We're going to take 48 subjects with untreated hyperlipidemia. They have high cholesterol, 12 are on beta blockers, 12 are on angiotensin receptor blockers, none are diabetic common diet over four weeks, baseline measurements, then you randomize them to placebo or berberine, 500 milligrams just once a day, red yeast rice, which is a green statin, the typical dose is 2,400 milligrams, here we're going to use 200, polycosone, and other green statin, and then you're going to repeat the baseline measurements. With the nutritional cocktail, cholesterol falls by 45 points, the LDL falls significantly, endothelial function improves. So endothelial dysfunction due to hyperlipidemia responds to berberine. Now, here we're going to take male rat corpus cavernosum tissue homogenates. This is um, the compartment within the penis that engorges in response to the generation of nitric oxide to mediate an erection. And we're going to record expression of nitric oxide synthase isoforms in tissue culture following incubation with vehicle berberine for one hour or three hours. And we can look at endothelial nitric oxide synthase that is important in endothelial function and erectile function, as is neuronal nitric oxide synthase. Conversely, inflammatory nitric oxide synthase, which is upregulated with systemic inflammation, is counterproductive and would compromise um, erectile function. So what you see, berberine has no effect on inducible nitric oxide synthase, but it upregulates endothelial. And so we would predict 
that berberine would be effective in erectile function just as it is in endothelial function. Berberine effect on the AMPK uncoupling protein pathway. We're going to take mice that are genetically abnormal. One group, they're called APOE double knockout. They can't make APOE. They are doomed to atherosclerosis. Their liver cannot pull cholesterol back into the liver cells. Another group, they, they're dysfunctional for APOE, and you knock out AMPK. So two key pathways are blocked. At five weeks of age, you put them all on an atherogenic diet, high cholesterol, high fat, plus or minus berberine. You sacrifice them at eight weeks. Now, uncoupling protein wastes energy. We have this assembly line through which we generate energy by burning, by burning carbon, basically from sugar and fat. Uncoupling protein wastes energy as heat. An uncoupling protein promotes weight loss. It promotes shivering when you're out in the cold. It also drains free radicals. So when we're experiencing too much oxidative stress, that activates AMPK, which activates uncoupling protein, and we cut back on our endogenous tonic generation of free radicals. So uncoupling protein blunts the generation of free radical species and is helpful in weight maintenance. Now, so these genetically abnormal animals that are double knockout for, for APOE, they have more plaque, but there's some protection with berberine because you're kicking an AMPK. The animals that are abnormal for APOE and AMPK, they have a lot more plaque. There's less uh, a beneficial effect of berberine because you can't, it, it can't work as well because AMPK is not working so well, they have more plaque. When we give berberine, we're going to phosphorylate AMPK. If the AMPK pathway is open, you'll phosphorylate it, but not if it's knocked out. The same thing with ACC carboxylase. So if we knock out AMPK, we can't downregulate the generation of cholesterol or um, fatty acids. Serum cholesterol in the APOE knockout mice with an intact AMPK responds to berberine, but if you knock out AMPK, you can't lower cholesterol. Um, circulating white cells, lymphocytes, bind to adhesion molecules, ICAM and ACAM, um, expressed by activated endothelial cells. And here, if we're looking at VCAM and ICAM, um, that's high in the APOE mice, but berberine working through AMPK can blunt it, but not if AMPK is knocked out. Um, if, if the phospholipids coating our LDL are oxidized by phospholipases, then the LDLs will clump together, they get stuck in the artery wall, they can't swim out, and they can be subjected to octative stress to, uh, and to propagate uh, uh, atherosclerosis. And a marker of lipid oxidation is malodialdehyde and another molecule called 4-hydroxytuenyl, and you can see that it, its generation is blunted by berberine if AMPK works, but not if AMPK doesn't work. Um, three, nitrosotyrosine. We make nitric oxide, and, which is a good guy, and if we don't need it instantly, we react it with acetylcysteine or glutathione to create a ready reserve of nitric oxide. Conversely, if we're subject to a great deal of oxidative stress, if we're making a lot of superoxide, we will take nitric oxide and oxidize it to proxy nitrate, which is a deleterious free radical, and as an index of proxy nitrate, we would measure nitrosotyrosine. You can see it's high in these, in these APOE and APOE uh, AMPK knockout mice. And if AMPK is open, we can block that with berberine. If AMPK is not open, we will not uh, create an antioxidant defense as we would expect because you can't translocate NERF2. Uncoupling protein is increased with berberine. Uncoupling protein is key in blunting oxidative stress. And as you can see, to upregulate uncoupling protein, we need AMPK. So berberine stimulates AMPK that increases uncoupling protein, which is key in preventing atherosclerosis. Now, we're going to take human umbilical vein endothelial cells and tissue culture and look at uncoupling protein messenger RNA transcription. It is increased with berberine. Other molecules that upregulate AMPK such as the experimental agent ALCAR or metformin, or exercise or caloric restriction would do the same thing. Exercise, caloric restriction, upregulate AMPK, berberine does the same thing. If you got diabetes and we're going to use a drug, we're going to use metformin because it will also upregulate AMPK. So when you look at 
uncoupling protein, it rises with berberine. If we add in a drug called actinomycin that blocks transcription, it's blunted. And the other AMPK agonist, ALCAR, its effects are blunted. Berberine increases transcript transcription of uncoupling protein and other mitochondrial proteins such as cytochrome C oxidase and uncoupling protein. Berberine is um, uh, biogenic for the mitochondria. It supports the mitochondria. Those are the cell furnaces. We want lots of mitochondria in our cells to make us efficient energy generators. Berberine does that. So it increases the efficiency of energy generation um, by upregulating mitochondrial function. Mitochondrial uncoupling protein decreases the efficiency of energy utilization, leading to weight loss. Decreases generation of free radical species, attenuates oxidative stress. Berberine activates AMPK, which downregulates HMG coreductase, which downregulates ACC carboxylase. You make less cholesterol, you make less fatty acids, you make less triglyceride. Mitochondrial biogenesis is enhanced, but we still decrease free radical generation, improve endothelial function. Inflammation is reduced, attenuated Th1, Th17 immune dysregulation, favor one atherosclerosis. Okay, berberine and post PCI, percutaneous intervention, that's balloon angioplasty or stent related inflammation. 181 patients that present to the hospital with an acute coronary syndrome, a small heart attack or unstable angina, they undergo successful PCI, balloon angioplasty or stent placement. And they're all sent home on standard therapy, clopidogrel, Plavix, an antiplatelet agent, aspirin, antiplatelet agent, atorvastat, a statin, which will block HMG reductase. Now, we can downregulate HMG reductase with berberine. We can poison it. We can block it with atorvastat. And they were also sent home on concomitant therapy, 95% of beta blocker, a third got an ACE inhibitor, and 70% were diabetic and were being treated. A, st a typical group of patients presenting at the hospital with an acute coronary event. So you do baseline measurements day one post-intervention, then randomize them to receive over 30 days standard therapy, standard therapy plus berberine, 400 milligrams three times a day, reevaluate at 30 days. Cholesterol and LDL fell with both groups. I don't know if berberine is going to add to 20 milligrams of atorvastatin within 30 days. Triglycerides fell a little bit more with berberine. Fasting glucose, there was no change. 70% of them were on diabetic medicines that were working because they had pretty good sugar control. C-reactor protein fell in both groups. It fell a little bit more with berberine. Interleukin-6, a work product of nuclear factor kappa beta, rose with control therapy and it fell with berberine. When you place a stent and you're crunching up the artery wall, you get a lot of inflammation, a lot of Th1, Th17 inflammation, which is predictive of restenosis as it's immediate of restenosis. We're blocking nuclear factor kappa beta, less uh, inflammation with berberine. Monocyte chemotactic protein is released by the endothelial cells to pull monocytes in. Hey, I got a problem. I want you to come in. VCAM1 and ICAM are the adhesion molecules. You see uh, lower levels of post-stent placement with the berberine-treated patients. Matrix metalloproteinases degrade the fibrous cap and play a role in, in turning a plaque from stable into vulnerable. That was blended with berberine. No adverse effects on kidney chemistries or liver chemistries. Three of the 68 subjects experienced nuisance GI side effects and stopped berberine. They actually could have just decreased the dose, but they just stopped it because it was part of a study. Major adverse event rate, heart attack death readmission was 10.1% with maximal medical therapy and 6.6% with berberine. So if we had berberine for $30 a month to standard drug therapy, um, three out of 100 people that were going to have an event post-stent didn't have it. If this was a drug, you'd be seeing television ads. But because it's berberine and American physicians just can't bring themselves to use nutritional supplements, you're not going to hear about it, except you heard about it from me. So when I'm sending you to the cath lab uh, and I think you might need a stent, of course, I'm going to put you on berberine because I don't want you to re-narrow. I don't want you to have an adverse event post-stent, and berberine will help when you add it to standard medical therapy. IV berberine and congestive heart failure, this study was done in China. 12 patients with advanced heart failure. They were having symptoms at rest or with minimal activity. They're class 3, class 4. Six with Chagas disease, which is a parasite that can affect the heart. 
four with a non-coronary cardiomyopathy, a, maybe a post-viral cardiomyopathy. One had a leaky valve, one had had multiple heart attacks. So 12 patients with advanced heart disease, they're all on a stable me medical regimen, they're all getting the standard of care pharmaceutical management. You have heart catheterization and echo, and then you treat them with IV berberine, low dose and then high dose, repeat the baseline studies each dosing level. Heart rate fell with low dose berberine and then went up again. Filling pressures fell. Filling, you know, we want low filling pressures. The high filling pressures are what makes you short of breath and give you edema. You could see that it falls with berberine because berberine is a vasodilator. It's an ACE inhibitor. So if we dilate the arteries, it's easier for the heart to pump forward. We know that berberine um, uh, in those experimental models of hypertension or diabetes when contractility and diastolic function is lost, berberine improves it. So we're not surprised that IV berberine lowers filling pressures in humans with heart failure. Cardiac index, the ability of the heart to squeeze, is increased with berberine. Vascular resistance falls, so the vessels are dilating. It makes it easier for the heart to pump into a dilated system. Ejection fraction, the percentage of blood squeezed out with the heart with each beat. Normal is 50%. These patients were pretty sick. They were 27% with IV berberine goes 42%. Wow. So powerful um, inotropic kick with IV berberine. Now, we don't use IV, IV berberine in Western medicine. And with these high doses, there was some electrical instability. They had some arrhythmias that, res that resolved after the berberine quieted down. But it just shows the power of berberine to improve cardiac performance in individuals with end-stage heart disease. So if IV berberine works, let's try it orally. 156 patients with advanced heart failure, mean ejection fraction is 22%. That's not good. Normal is 50%. They had over 90 extra heartbeats, PVCs, or they had non-sustained ventricular tachycardia. Ventricular tachycardia is when you have abnormal beats sequentially. 60% were ischemic, 40% had a non-coronary dilated cardiomyopathy. They're all on a stable medical regimen, maximal standard uh, drug therapy. Do baseline measurements, randomize them to placebo or berberine, three to 500 milligrams four times a day. You start at 300 milligrams four times a day, you do blood levels, which you can do in China, and you increase it if the level's low. So you get them on a stable dose of berberine based upon the blood level, repeat the baseline measurements at eight weeks, and periodic reassessment over two years. New York Heart Association functional class improved in both groups. There's always a placebo effect when you're in a clinical trial. It improved a little bit more with berberine. How far you could walk in six minutes improved with both groups and improved a little bit more with berberine. Ejection fraction rose five points with placebo therapy. It rose 10 points with berberine. That's a nice increase in ejection fraction. The number of extra beats per 24 hours plummeted with berberine non-sustained ventricular tachycardia when you're stringing the PVCs together, we don't want to see that fell. So in the, the diabetic heart attack animal model, berberine had an antrophic effect, which we are seeing in humans with advanced heart failure when we add berberine to maximal drug therapy. We're protecting against arrhythmia. Event rate over two years. Death rate fell from 16% to 9%. Hospitalization fell from 36% to 20%. Hospitalization with heart failure is kind of expensive. That's a big problem for Medicare, and we could dramatically decrease the need for hospitalization if we give our patients berberine for $30 a month. Mortality, hospitalization, sudden death, heart failure, all those adverse events were blunted by adding berberine to maximal drug therapy. So we are certainly synergizing with pharmaceutical intervention. The clinical use of berberine for lipid management, we start at 500 milligrams twice a day, go to three times a day if the results poor. If you're taking a high dose of a statin, you're going to be making more PCSK9, so you may need a higher dose of berberine, because one of berberine's jobs is to blunt PCSK9. Take a lot of statin, you're making a lot of PCSK9, you may need more berberine. And if you are struggling with your statin with muscle pain, I can put you on berberine, typically cut your statin in half. I'm going to get the same degree of cholesterol reduction. You won't have the muscle symptoms, and I get synergistic inflammation. Glucose management, we start at 500 twice a day, go to three times a day if the results are suboptimal. This will synergize with all other forms of diabetic management because berberine causes you to elaborate more insulin receptors, and it improves intracellular insulin signaling. Inflammation or toxicity, 500 milligrams twice a day. We can go to three times a day if needed. Cardiovascular disease, the same dose. We can go up to 2,000 milligrams a day in heart failure. We really can't hurt you with berberine. 
However, the more berberine I give you, the more likely you are to have GI side effects. What are the concerns? 5% of you will have gas, cramping, constipation, or diarrhea. We decrease the dose, the side effects go away. I've only had one patient who just couldn't take berberine at all. A rare patient, totally intolerant. Now, if you are taking insulin or sulfonylurea drugs that kick insulin out of your pancreas, and we improve insulin sensitivity, we have to be on the lookout to cut back on your drugs, otherwise you could get hypoglycemic. Berberine itself cannot cause abnormal hypoglycemia. All it does is make your own insulin work better, but if you're on these drugs, I have to be cognizant of that. There's been a single case report in the world literature of pathologic bradycardia that's a low heart rate due to berberine. So we're gonna give you this case history. 53-year-old obese and hyperlipidemic, but physically active man, he lived in Italy, he comes into the hospital with shortness of breath and fatigue. He was begun on berberine um, six days earlier for cholesterol control. His labs, his cardiac echo was normal. His EKG shows a low heart rate. Your heart rate should be at least 60. He has what's called sinus bradycardia. There was a conduction delay. His heart rate was slow. The junctional pacemaker was kicking in. So he's got like what we would call a hypervagal physiology. He's got the slows. So. They held Burbine for 24 hours, cared a stress EKG. He went five minutes. His heart rate didn't rise as much as it should have. He has what's called hypertrophic incompetence. So he's got what we would probably call sick sinus syndrome. Low heart rate, poor conduction, heart rate doesn't rise adequately with exercise. We frequently see this with aging. This man had it some degree at age 53 that was aggravated by Burbine. So you hold the berberine, complete resolution of symptoms, you repeat the stress test at 10 days, resting heart rate's 43, it rises more with exercise. So, and the Holter showed this, this slowness, this hypervagotonic state. So this man had the slows, a hypervagotonic state, a tendency of six sinus syndrome that was aggravated by berberine. We're not gonna see this in young people, but in older people who have a low heart rate or individuals on drugs to lower heart rate, we will be watchful to, that we don't lower your heart rate too much with berberine. So far, I've not seen this, but I will keep looking for it. So berberine's been used in traditional Chinese medicine for over 2,000 years. It was no, its hypoglycemic effects were noted in 1988. Dr. Kong, when he was screening Chinese herbs for their lipid lowering effects, found that berberine, above all other herbal uh, molecules, was the best at upregulating LDL receptor regulation. 2014, I'm saying it's of universal value in the prevention and treatment of cardiovascular disease. My colleagues in the Fellowship of Anti-Aging and Regenerative Medicine said, gee, Dr. Roberts, if you're gonna say berberine's of universal value, you must prove that it meets Poling's postulates. And Poling's postulates for a universally um, favorable cardiovascular nutritional, it must work on atherosclerotic risk factors, metabolic syndrome, and diabetes. Insulin insensitivity, lipids, hypertension, weight. Endothelial function, oxidative stress must improve. Inflammation, Th1, Th17 immune dysregulation must be attenuated without damping the appropriate immune response. We want to make sure you can still respond to infection, and we can with berberine. Actually, berberine has an antimicrobial effect, and we blunt autoimmunity and collateral tissue damage. Define mechanisms at levels of transcription and translation and post-translational modification, phosphorylating and dephosphorylating molecules. We've, we've achieved this. Limited toxicity, it's hard to hurt you with berberine. It's, it's, it's limited by GI side effects. Reasonable cost, $30 a month. Published studies to document mechanisms and efficacies. Probably a thousand studies in the world literature on berberine. Synergy with pharmaceutical and mechanical interventions. Berberine activates AMP-sensitive protein kinase. It sends a burn energy, do not build signal, favorable effects on lipids, sugar, weight. We attenuate oxidative stress, inflammation. We improve endothelial function. We protect our cells against toxic apoptosis while encouraging malignant cells to commit suicide apoptosis. The leading um, cause of death in the history of mankind is infection. We're very good at recognizing and responding to infection. Unfortunately, the milieu of modern man contains signals that mimic infection, and our body cannot tell inflammation from high sugar, high fat diet, metals, organic pollutants, leaky gut, visceral fat, allergy, from inflammation, from real threats. So we are going to dephosphorylate AMPK. We will dephosphorylate HMG reductase. We're gonna start making cholesterol. 
We're going to activate rho kinase. We're going to make superoxide, inflammation, oxidative stress. Um, we will shoot nuclear factor kappa bit in the nucleus. We will um, oxidize our LDL. Our monocytes and vascular smooth muscle cells will engorge with LDL. However, with berberine, we can rectify all this. We block activation of queen jadis, ICPA kinase. We're going to block nuclear factor kappa beta translocation. We're going to keep activator protein 1 from reading our DNA to generate inflammatory mediators. We're going to block superoxide generation from NADPH oxidase. We're going to promote beneficial translocation of NERF2 to make antioxidant and antitoxicity enzymes. By upregulating the AMPK, we're going to lower lipids. We're going to lower glucose. We're going to block hyperlipidemia and hyperglycemia due to inflammation. We're going to help with weight. We're going to block oxidative inflammatory stress. Endothelial function improves. Cardiovascular physiology improves. A host of clinical effects. Tonight, in this section, we talked about benefits on endothelial function. Hypertension may improve. In animal models, protection against afterload-induced left hypertrophy, heart failure, and kidney injury. Protection against restenosis. In in humans treated with stent placement or balloon angioplasty for an acute coronary event, lower cytokine elaboration, improved outcome. In humans with advanced heart failure on maximum medical therapy, you had berberine, increase in functional status and ejection fraction, decreased arrhythmia, fewer events, berberine synergizes with and adds to standard pharmaceutical measures. The Chronicles of Berberine has now been completed, and I hope you gained a great deal of personal health wisdom on our journey. Thank you for your attention.